ever felt a little anxious or a lot anxious or fearful or are you a human being that's been alive sometime in the year 2020 and leading into 2021? Well, we're going to be talking about fear and anxiety today in part three of our three-part series on fear and anxiety. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time visiting with us today, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to taking God's Word and making it simple. We want to help you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. Also, at some point, if you appreciate this ministry and content, make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn that bell notification to all, so you don't miss any future videos. We would love to have you as part of our family. Okay, guys, so the last two weeks, we have been speaking about worry and anxiety, kind of using those two terms interchangeably, and I told you that fear is a little bit different, and I think about fear differently, and I don't know if that's just because of my background in the self-defense world and martial arts, as well as working with various groups over the years, um, but... Fear is different in my view than worry and anxiety, and, and I'm going to define what I mean by that today, um, but I see fear as a gift and part of the wiring that God has given us that in and of itself is not right or wrong. Anxiety and worry is ultimately self-idolatry, and we talked about that over the last few weeks, although I don't know if I actually used that term the last couple of weeks, but anyway, let's move on. So The Gift of Fear is actually the title of a book, although honestly it's, it's not like a copyrightable thing because it's a common concept, but that book made it a, a household phrase, I guess, is probably the best way to word it. Um, and I don't remember, it's been a while since I read that book. It's been a long while. Um, so I don't think that it's a Christian book, but it is a good one for a self-defense perspective. But that's beside the point. If I remember, I'll put a link down in the description. Uh, at least as of now, all links are non-affiliate links. Um, I don't get anything out of those links as of the recording of this video. If that changes in the future, if I do end up setting up like an Amazon affiliate or something, I'll note that down below so that that is correct. Um, but anyway, as of the recording of this video, I don't make any money. I just think that it's a helpful book. All right, so anyway, the gift of fear or the concept of the gift of fear. Um, we don't think about fear as something that would be a gift. It's, it's like the movie, um, The Greatest Gift. I think that was the title of the movie. Uh, the old man passes away and his young grandson who's just all full of himself and he gives him these various gifts like the gift of work and he ends up way out in a field somewhere, right? It's this mind bender philosophy of gifts. But fear is a gift, and we're going to talk about that today. Fear is a momentary or learned response to a threat or potential threat. Let me say that again. Fear is a momentary or learned response to a threat or a potential threat. Fear is a gift from God that is designed to lead us from something bad and harmful towards something good and safe. So let me, let me give you an example. People that are afraid of heights, why are they afraid of heights? Well, possibly because human nature knows that if we fall from very far, like let's take, uh, if you've ever gone on a skyscraper in a big city, one of the ones that has the deck and you can look over the side, right? Although I know now they're baby proofing everything and you know, all of that, but right? It, I don't know. I think you can still look over the side on some of them. The one that I remember in particular is Cincinnati. I, th I think there were two that you could go up on in Cincinnati. But anyway, you could look right over the side and it's like, oh, okay, yeah. I would definitely be dead if I dropped from here or fell from here, right? Uh, or when you're up on one of those big bridges, dri you know, driving with your car, especially if you're from Charleston, South Carolina, where I spent most of my time growing up, the old Cooper River bridges, the really old one that was only two lanes, I mean, you could feel that thing shaking. And, you know, I had a small car, you know, we had a small car, and I mean, you can just look right over the edge, staring down at the ocean way down below, right? Or technically river at that point. That was a little scary, right? Because you know that if you fall, you're dead, right? 
Or perhaps somebody did fall from a certain height. Like, I don't know, maybe they were a kid. They were the crazy kid that jumped off the roof of their single story house and broke their leg. And now they're scared to be even on top of a ladder, right? That's a learned response or the one where we just look over the edge into the abyss, right? Um, that is a momentary response. The looking over and going, yeah, I'd die if I fell down there. You know, that causes you, there's a visceral reaction within you that goes, you know, I might not want to get that close to the edge. Now, I am not particularly afraid of heights. I've worked in boom trucks and all kinds of stuff. I've even been in boom trucks and jumped. OSHA shouldn't be listening to this, but I've jumped from the bucket of a truck uh, onto a platform, you know, many stories up in the air before as an electrician. I'm not particularly scared of heights, but that doesn't mean I don't respect them. It doesn't mean that I don't look down and go, yeah, that would really hurt if I fell. Um, but there is something visceral in you that when you look over the edge, you're like, mm, I don't know about that, right? That's a gift because if we didn't have that, if God had not given us that gift, what would we do? We're, we're, let's be honest, we're stupid human beings. We'd be like, oh, cool, how close can I get? And then poof, just like a lemming, right? We'd fall right off the edge. Um, so there's a reason that God gives us fear, especially the momentary and or the learned responses, but momentary in particular is the gift. But we should be afraid of certain things in the sense of it being a warning system. The same thing is why is there physical pain, right? Why did God give us physical pain? Well, if you didn't have physical pain and there are medical conditions where people don't feel pain, then you wouldn't know when you were being injured. Like imagine sticking your hand in a fire because you wanted something and you didn't feel pain. Right? Just because you don't feel pain doesn't mean that your hand isn't being burned off, which is going to cause all kinds of problems. Right, So pain is a good thing, even though it stinks. It hurts, literally. Right, um, So the gift of fear is ultimately to keep us safe. So it is a momentary or learned response to a threat or potential threat. So let me reread the next part. Fear is a gift from God that is designed to lead us from something bad or harmful and towards something good and safe. Fear is not necessarily a good or bad thing. It is a natural response that God has given us for our safety, for our well-being, so that we don't die quicker than we're going to die anyway. And by the way, there is a parallel to salvation and repentance there, right? I mean, I don't think that we should major on hell when we're talking about the gospel. I think that tends to offend people more than it helps. But it doesn't mean that fear of hell is always bad. If, if we understand, if we don't understand the grace of God, but we do understand the wrath of God, and that is enough to get us to turn... That's something that God can use. There's a parallel here, right? And that's a different discussion for a different day as far as evangelism methods. But the short, nut, the short nutshell version for me, I don't think that we need to major on hell. We don't need to hide from it. It's a real thing. But I don't think that needs to be the majority of what we're talking about. Most people that I have talked with over the years, and I've spoken with countless people over the years, most people, they have a concept of needing to be with God. Most of the time, they don't need that threat of hell to be a motivator. What I find in most cases is that people just don't seem to understand, and maybe it's just the people I hang around, but they don't feel that they can know that God is real and that God demands a relationship with us. That's where they struggle. It's like, well, you've got Christians, you've got Buddhists, you've got Hinduism, you've got all these different religions, especially in the modern day with all of the information that we have now most of the people that I speak with, it's not a question of, should I be seeking out a God? It's the question is, how do I know which one is real or whether any of it is real? That's usually the question. So don't shy away from the discussion of hell, but that's probably, that shouldn't be our main card that we use, so to speak. Anyway, uh, way, way off topic now. Okay, so I defined fear. Fear is a momentary or learned response to a threat or a potential threat. Anxiety and worry, remember I use those interchangeably, is when we let fear, doubt, and idolatry control us. Because 
anxiety and worry is ultimately idolatry. And again, I didn't go into this as much in the last two videos, so I'll address it in this one. But anxiety and, and worry, especially when we get to the point of them overwhelming us, it is a form of idolatry. Because what we're saying when we're worrying is we're saying that I have the power to fix this, so I need to fix this, but I can't figure out how to fix this, therefore now I'm anxious or worried. Or the alternative, I know that God is capable, but God is not fixing it. And he should be fixing it, but he's not, and therefore I'm anxious and worried. On one hand, you're trusting in yourself. On the other hand, you're distrusting God. And often it's both when we're truly anxious and worried. It's actually both. So if you've never thought about it before, anxiety and worry is ultimately, at, at its root, it is idolatry. It is saying that I know better than God and I need to take control because God's not doing his job. That is what anxiety and worry are rooted in. All right, so anxiety and worry is when we let fear, doubt, and idolatry control us. And that's the key. It's not saying that we won't have a momentary response. That's fear. It's when we cross over into letting that control us, that's when we've crossed over into anxiety and worry that is sinful. It's the old analogy. You may or may not have heard this one before. I heard this growing up all the time from preachers talking about like uh, evil thoughts and things like that. It's the old analogy. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. And yes, I grew up in the South, so you have lots of little sayings like that. But if you think about it for a second, the gift of fear, fear comes from God. When something bad happens, it's natural for me to freak out a little bit. It would be inhuman not to. But when I start letting that control me, that's a different story. So I can't prevent things from happening. I can't prevent the fact that as a human being, I'm going to react at some level. But I can prevent it from controlling me by trusting in the Lord. By the way, if you haven't caught it, you can catch part one and then part two of the series. So part one a second ago, and then part two of the series. If you haven't caught them, make sure to catch those. So you, can, you can't stop a bird flying over your head, but you can prevent it from building a nest in your hair, right? And it's a silly analogy, but it's one that works. You remember that, right? I'm not going to prevent things from happening. I'm not going to prevent my human reaction initially. But I can prevent it from controlling me by leaning into Christ, like I talked about in the other videos. Anxiety is ultimately a form of idolatry. And that's a hard one. And by the way, if you're counseling someone and they're struggling with anxiety, they do need to hear that truth at some point in the counseling. But don't Beat them over the head with it. You know, if someone comes to you, you know, I'm really anxious, I'm, I'm really nervous about this going on, and I'm just worried, the first thing out of your mouth would not be, well, you realize that's a form of idolatry, don't you? You're just sinning. All you're doing is adding burdens to someone that's already burdened. Now, at some point, that should come out. Like, I'm not saying hide from the truth. But in your process of counseling, give the love and grace, listen to the person, figure out what's going on, and help them come to the point of understanding that it's idolatry. But that shouldn't be your main thing. Just like I talked earlier about hell should not be your, your motivator first, even though you don't hide from it, you speak the truth in love. Um, we're not hiding anything, but it doesn't need to be the first thing, right? Um, there's a good book called The Grace and Truth Paradox. I'll try to remember to put a link for that down in the description. Again, as of the recording of this video, none of these are affiliate links, as in I don't earn any money off of them. They're just helpful resources. At some point, I do plan to do affiliate uh, with Amazon, and if things go well, who knows? with all the uh, censorship here lately, who knows what'll happen, but I would like to do affiliate stuff later, so at some point if that changes, I'll make a note down there that it is an affiliate at that point. Okay, so now let me read John 16, 33, and I read this in, if it wasn't last week, it was the first week, I can't remember, but I wanna read it again. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, 
but take courage, I have overcome the world. Now, I talked about that more in depth in one of the two last videos, whichever one it was, so I'm not going to go back into that. But remember, Jesus is the one that we lean into. We can take courage because we know that He is ultimately in control, talking about God's sovereignty, His absolute control. The same God that spoke the world into existence is the same God that gives you access to Him directly and, in fact, indwells you with the Holy Spirit. Now, courage. Courage is facing fear and choosing to overcome it. See, I talked about how you can't help the fear response when something bad comes up. There's going to be at least a moment of, whoa, I'm a little afraid here. Just like looking over that edge, you're like, oh, let me just back up a little bit, right? Um, and, and if you're like me, you might be thinking, hmm, I wonder if this building is still structurally sound. Or like I said, if you grew up in the Charleston, South Carolina area, that old bridge, you're like, yeah, this thing isn't structurally sound anymore, but we also don't have a choice but to drive over it. Um, right? Courage is facing fear and choosing to overcome it. It doesn't mean that we're never afraid. It means that we're never controlled by our fear. And if you are in the self-defense world, whether that means martial arts, law enforcement, military, um, if you are in that world, then you understand this. Because when bad guys start doing bad things to you, if you allow fear to control you, you will be a liability to yourself, you will probably get yourself killed, and you will be a liability to others, you will probably get them killed as well. So you cannot let fear control you, you must overcome it. That's courage. Courage is facing fear and choosing to overcome it. It doesn't mean we're never afraid. It means we're never controlled by our fear. Again, courage is facing fear and choosing to overcome it. And that is the confidence as a Christian. That's the confidence that we have in Christ. The ability to overcome it is because we have confidence in Christ. Just like I talked about last week, the child hiding behind mommy or daddy's leg. We do that with Christ. Now, I want to share from you with 1 Corinthians 15, 58, specifically talking about that. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. All the bad stuff that's happening, therefore, be steadfast, immovable. That's the idea of a fighter taking their stance. So if you're talking about like martial arts or something like that or law enforcement, right? Um, if, if you're law enforcement and somebody starts approaching you, you're right-handed. This is my right hand. Some of you have trouble with mirroring. That's fine. But right, I'm, I'm right-handed. So if I'm going to reach for a firearm, it's going to be on my right, right? In law enforcement, you're instinctively going to do this, right? You got one hand out to create space. You got one hand going in case you need your firearm, right? Military, you're going to be reaching for that sling if it's at distance, right? You're going to be reaching for that sling wherever you got that thing slung on you. You're instinctively going to be setting your stance and getting ready with that main weapon, in a scenario like a self-defense scenario, right? If you've got a knife, you might be reaching for that knife. You might be uh, in just open hands, right? But it's the idea of a fighter setting their stance. I'm here. I've drawn a line in the sand. I'm not moving. It's time to do business, right? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Don't let all of this stuff wash you away in your faith, in your, in your faith journey, to use modern language, right? Don't let all the stuff overwhelm you. Be steadfast, immovable. Uh, one of the pastors at a church that I served at a long time ago, uh, we did a um, trip to Fort Wilderness, and uh, in that trip, this was the theme verse for that trip. And he said, steadfast, immovable. And then we had to repeat, steadfast, immovable. And it drove me nuts at the time. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so cheesy. I understand what you're doing, but man, come on. Don't say it again. I'm going to smack you if you say it again, right? And then he'd say it again. But it worked. I still remember to this day, you know, that was, I don't know, 10, 11 years ago, something like that. Um, but I still remember to this day, steadfast, immovable, right? It still comes to mind. So 
to that pastor, bravo, it worked. All right, so I'm gonna close with a story. It's story time. Um, and I'll have one, one other thought after I share the story. But this is an example of the steadfast immovable. And I just share this because it's a fond memory for me, but I think it also helps illustrate the point. Um, I, was, uh, I started working with law enforcement actually as an explorer. Uh, later on, I did that through the martial arts. I trained law enforcement uh, guys and some military um, through the martial arts. But I started working with law enforcement as an explorer, which is like the police version of the Boy Scouts. Um, but the city that I did the explorers in, they ran it a little different than, uh, and I hope I don't get anybody in trouble with this, but they ran it, well, no, no, the chief at the time, he knew, so no, I'm not getting anybody in trouble. Um, had to pause there for a second, but the, the chief that is there now is not the chief that was there then, but the chief at the time, he wanted to use the explorers as a recruiting tool, tool so he gave them more leeway, the advisors more leeway than a lot of explorer groups do. But anyway, whatever. Um, I started, so here I am as 14 years old, and I am uh, learning about police work and going on ride-alongs and stuff like that. And I'll never forget this one. It's funny, but it was one of those random defining moments. And by the way, I had already been through lots of bad stuff prior to this. You may have heard me reference my dad and some other bad things that happened uh, as a child. So, I mean, I was already long since dealing with bad things, but this is just one of those comforting moments when you realize, you know, when it comes down to it, I'll be okay. So here's the story. We we pull in, you know, obviously I'm the passenger since I'm the explorer. We ended up having to arrest this guy that was drunk and belligerent and, you know, who knows what he was going to do. Uh, we had to arrest him. If I remember right, he kept going back to his mom's house after he had been kicked out, whatever. Drunk and disorderly. So we pull up, and this is back in the days that only Crown Vicks existed uh, for police work, and there were no body cams and all of that. So just a little trip down memory lane for some of you Leo guys out there. Um, but we pull into the Sally Port, and if you don't know law enforcement procedure, I think all, but let's say most just in case, uh, most law enforcement groups, when you pull into the, uh, the jail or wherever you're going to house the prisoners while they're going through the initial booking and processing, you pull into, essentially it's a big garage. So uh, ours, we had one lane in our sally port. You, you pull in, only one car at a time could do anything. In the grand scheme of police departments, this was a small police department, but it's the third largest in our state. Um, so I guess you can figure out which city I'm talking about now if you, if you do your math. But anyway, um, at least at the time, there was only one lane for the sally port. I assume that's different now because it's been, the station's been redone. But um, so you have two open doors, those big garage rolling doors, and you pull in. And then what's supposed to happen is both of those get shut and then you take the prisoner out of the car or the suspect at that point. You take them out of the car, you take them into the building for booking, then you come back out and move your car, uh, and then the next person can pull in. Um, well, the officer was fairly new at the time. Now, I love this officer, and if there's any chance that he is working, or, or sorry, if there's any chance that he's watching this video, brother, I love you and I'm not picking on you. It's just one of those things looking back, um, you're gonna, probably laugh thinking about this one as well, um, I hope. But anyway, um, no, you're good natured, you will. But anyway, um, so we pull in and the door wasn't shut. And I don't remember at the time, I think at the time, I don't remember if there was a switch on the wall or if it was one of the people inside that was supposed to shut it. But whatever the case, the doors didn't shut. The doors were not shut. And the officer was just having an off night. I don't know, there's probably something going on in his personal life, but I was 14. It's not like he was talking to me about his personal life. Um, but whatever the case, we pull in, he gets the suspect out of the car, um, still in handcuffs. And the suspect is standing near the driver's door of the car and I am in between him and freedom. So the officer, for some reason, couldn't find his keys. Now, I don't know how you lose your keys from turning off the ignition to walking to the door behind you, but somehow he lost his keys. He couldn't find them. Um, so he's freaking out because he's lost his keys and here we've got this prisoner and, you know, whatever. So 
in, in wonderful, logical, I'm going to harass him fashion, somehow he comes to the conclusion that the keys must be in the trunk of the car, even though he's not been in the trunk of the car yet. I, I don't know. Something was going on that night, but he just wasn't thinking clearly. He, he thought his keys must be in the trunk, so he uses the button. He pushes the button, pops the trunk open. He's digging around in the trunk. So he's got the trunk lid between him and the prisoner now, and I'm sure he was peeking over occasionally. He was, he was a good officer. This is like major humiliation story, but funny to look back on your rookie self. Um, he was a good officer, though. Um, but, you know, you got the trunk lid, and you can't see the guy anymore. So I'm standing between him and freedom, and he's looking at me, and I'm 14 years old. I am a child, and he is a full-grown man. And the officer is at the back of the car, obviously. He's at the trunk. So there's literally nothing between the prisoner and freedom but me. And handcuffs aren't that hard to deal with if people are given a little bit of time. And sometimes they're not that hard to deal with if they're not given much time. So it's not unusual for prisoners to take off even when they're in handcuffs. And since the door wasn't shut, it was me and him and freedom. And he started sizing me up. You just all the telltale signs. He started sizing me up and I could tell. And then he started barking at me, like actually rough, rough barking at me. Um, and at that point, the officer, I know he looked over at one point and then went back to trying to find his keys. So, and I know this story is taking a long time, but hey, hopefully you enjoy it. Um, so anyway, he, he starts barking at me, and I realize that he's testing me. Like, I'm, I'm self-aware enough, and I'm in the moment enough. I know he's testing me. So I just drop my one leg back, and I bring my hands up like this. I think I did my fingertips or something like that. And this is, you know, this is a fairly neutral way to stand in the self-defense world. You know, sometimes people do this or something like that. But something to get your hands up in case you need to go to work. And uh, the bad guy obviously knew this because as soon as I dropped into my comfortable stance, I was just ready. It wasn't like a full-blown fighting stance, but I dropped my right leg back and uh, I'm ambidextrous, but more on the right side. So right-handed ambidextrous, however you want to word it. I use both fairly equally, but tend to favor my right. So therefore I dropped my right leg back and my hands are up. And he knew the signs and that was enough. He stopped barking and he stopped acting like he wanted to try and get away and run through me. Now, if he had tried, could I have handled myself? I think, but I'm not sure. And the officer was literally feet away. The second I had yelled, he'd have been involved. But at that moment, the only thing between me and, or that guy and freedom was me. So there's nothing the officer could have done in five to 10 seconds. And that may not sound like much, but in a self-defense situation, five to 10 seconds is an eternity. Okay, steadfast, immovable. See, when I saw the threat, I got into my stance. I got ready to deal with the potential threat. I got into my stance, I got my hands up, and I was ready to go to work if I needed to. That is being steadfast, immovable. And that is the confidence that we can have in Christ because we know that whatever happens out there, we are secure in Him so we can get our footing in Him. He is our foundation, our rock. He is that stance and ready position to put it in self-defense terms. All right, so let me close with this. So ultimately, when we are overcome by fear, it is a result of some form of idolatry, choosing to believe that something else is more powerful than God or that something else can deliver when God cannot or will not. And those are false thoughts, by the way. To put anything in God's place is not only idolatry, but it's setting you up and everyone else up for failure because whoever or whatever you are counting on is not capable of fulfilling that role. See, in marriage, it's really easy to make your spouse your all. But you can't do that because your spouse can't be God. They can't be everything to you. Some people try to make children their all, but that's not fair. Neither your spouse nor your children can be your all. And it's the same thing here. Whatever it is that we think we're trusting in when we're anxious, and it's usually our minds, and then we realize how futile we are, and that's why we end up in that whole anxious loop. So bottom line, if you are counting on anything other than God, it's already failed.
because nothing else can take his place and nothing else can do what he can do. Therefore, like we've been talking about for the previous two weeks and now this week, lean into God, trust Him with the outcome. Have courage, allow fear to do its job. It is supposed to lead you away from things that are harmful and towards something that is good, i.e. the Lord. And then have the courage to overcome that fear in His strength, not on your own, but in His strength, have the courage to overcome that fear. All right, guys, as often, this video is way longer than I intended. I hope that you enjoyed it. I spent a lot of time sharing that story. Oh, by the way, um, the officer ended up finding the keys in his pocket. They were in his right pocket the whole time. He shoved them in his pocket and then couldn't feel them or something. I don't know. But that's where the keys ended up being. Um, but I hope you enjoyed that story. Let me know down in the comments. I, you know, I don't want to share stories that are that long all the time. But, you know, let me, sh let me know if you appreciate those little personal stories. To me, I like that when I'm listening to somebody because it helps me understand them and, and learn who they are a little better. It just makes me feel more connected. But I don't want to waste a lot of time either if it's not appreciated or helpful. So let me know in the comments whether you appreciate those kind of stories or not. But anyway, again, um, this video was way longer than I intended, so I appreciate you hanging out with me. As always, if you appreciate this ministry, make sure you hit that like, subscribe, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. And of course, please share this video with others that you think it may be helpful or to whom it may be helpful. Um, so make sure you share and become an ambassador and just share our videos and that will greatly help our ministry to grow and pick up more in, more uh, subscribers and therefore have a greater amount of influence for the kingdom of God. All right, guys, thank you very much and God bless.